Hello, and thanks for watching another episode of ARFCOM News, your source for the finest 2A propaganda brought to you by TNVC.com. Today, I want to tell you about how lawyers for Washington, D.C. argued the government has the authority to ban carry on public transportation because the government owns it and, well, you could find other ways to get where you want to be, citing the sensitive places language in the Bruin decision. And the FPC and SAF joined forces to file a lawsuit against the state of New York for its Flores Lava Bill, which was passed in brazen disregard to the Bruin ruling. And my apologies for the minor sidetrack, but I think it really is important to maintain the perspective here. New York City has been the platonic ideal of corruption since before it was New Amsterdam. Over a hundred years ago, Tammany Hall thugs passed the Sullivan Act on a wave of xenophobia to disarm immigrants and have their political opposition arrested with planted evidence. That's not hyperbole either. The law was intentionally written to allow police to hand out permits to anyone who paid well enough and deny them to minorities and the poor. The fact it remained in effect for over a century is a testament to how ethically bankrupt the state and city of New York are. Then, once the highest court in the land finally and decisively told New York they cannot deprive the people of their right to be armed, Governor Karen Hodor rammed a bill through her rubber stamp legislature denying the people their right to be armed, basically everywhere. It's impossible to understate the audacity of her floor is lava policy, and I'm glad to see the SAF and FPC taking it on. It's going to take years and dozens of appeals and whole herds of freshly fed and watered lawyers to get it all sorted out, but I think we'll win because to defend New York's and DC's carry bans, their attorneys are going to have to find historical precedent for similar bans, and that's just going to be really hard to do. As an example, Ammo Land recently published an image from 1884 showing practically everyone on a New York streetcar to be armed. There just isn't any historical tradition of bans, so the Bruin decision will be pushing the state back into its constitutionally limited cage for years to come. If you want to help, but doing stuff is like hard and you don't have much money, Please consider adding the SAF, FPC, or any other worthy gun rights organization to your Amazon Smile account. That way, big tech will automatically donate to the cause every time you shop on Amazon. If you like seeing stuff more than not seeing stuff, take a look at our sponsor, TNBC.com, your source for quality night vision gear to make you the bump in the night. You want incontrovertible proof of how Gun control laws are so bizarre and arcane, no ordinary person could possibly be expected to comply. The Truth About Guns found a Sheriff Department auction in Texas, where the department was selling an AK pistol to which someone had attached a vertical foregrip. If you're like a mega gun nerd, you know a vertical foregrip magically transforms a gun into a death stick because the ATF says so. The reasoning, if we could be so generous as to use that term, is based on how the 68 GCA defines a pistol, in part, as a device intended to be fired with one hand. So, obviously, if you can fire it with two hands, then it isn't intended to be fired with one hand. And, of course, a vertical foregrip makes it possible to grip a weapon with your weak hand, but it would be impossible to use your weak hand to grasp a weapon on his handguard. And while devices like angled foregrips and those cool gas pedal takedown levers are definitely not designed to accommodate the use of a second hand, vertical foregrips definitely are designed in such a way you could never again fire a weapon one-handed after attaching one. Of course, I'm just being facetious, but I hope it illustrates how bizarrely contradictory the official line is here. The rules are so incomprehensible, not even a law enforcement agency can keep up with them. A federal district court judge in Texas just declared it is unconstitutional to ban people from buying guns if they are under indictment for a felony. An indictment is not a conviction after all, and constitutional rights can't just be wished away because a person is accused of a crime. Besides, if they really are so dangerous they can't be allowed to buy a gun, then you shouldn't be releasing them from jail with or without bond. 
Did you all see the Giga Chad who brought a box o boogles to a New York gun turn in event and made $900? The flyer promised 25 bucks for each auto seer, but the authorities tried to find every way they could to weasel out of paying him, even while handing out 25 bucks a pop to the other people who were turning in auto seers. They still tried to claim he needed an upper and a lower and an auto seer to get the 25 bucks. Then they forgot all about that whole no questions asked thing and started asking a bunch of questions. I want to ask you a bunch of questions. They want to have them answered immediately. And they implied they would arrest him, but ultimately they paid up. Nine hundo is only enough for 36 of those little boogles, and it looks like there's hundreds in the box, but it's also a whole hell of a lot more than what it cost him in PLA, and I say any money we can drain from authoritarian legal funds is worth the effort. Coincidentally, there's another turn-in event scheduled in New York for this Saturday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., this one looks pretty lucrative with a $200 prepaid card plus an iPad for handguns and salty boys. At that rate, you could buy actual factory built handguns and still turn a profit, but this is perfect for a run of 3D printed liberators and harlots. No funky rules about homemade or ghost guns. <laughs> but they did wise up and drop the price for shotguns to about what it costs to make one. Oddly, Current and former police are prohibited from participating. I wonder why that could be. Do you folks have any ideas? Comment below. Industry News. Ride On just released a new Thunder Ranch LPVO developed with Clint Smith's Wisdom. It's a one to six power, second focal plane, illuminated scope with a bullet drop compensating reticle featuring elevation holds at 25, 100, 200, 300, 400, and 500 yards, as well as wind holds for five and 10 miles per hour at 300, 400, and 500 yards. It has six brightness levels with an offsetting between each of them, a removable throw lever, and adjustments are in mills. Price is 900. SIG's new MCX Spear model is getting a lot of attention this week. The LT line has a lighter handguard and barrel than the Army's version of the MCX, and unlike the Army's version of LT's, SIG's LT will almost never get you lost. But like the Army's version of LT's, it still probably won't show up to formation. It also comes in a variety of flavors, including 7.62x39, which is like 300 blackout, but for grown-ups. Not to worry, if the punishing recoil of 7.62x39 is just too much for you, it's also available in 7.62x35mm and 5.56x45mm. And now, your moment of zen. Hey friend, do you like pews and pew related things? Do you want to help us keep delivering you pure and good American pew propaganda at the low, low price of free 99? <laughs> we literally couldn't make this show if it weren't for the generous support of TNVC.com, purveyors of the finest non-GMO night vision devices handcrafted from fine Corinthian leather in the old world style. They also have mounts, lights, training, swag, and all sorts of other barrel-aged single malt gear to make you the bump in the night. And remember, if you aren't subscribed to our channel, you make puppies cry and Captain America's disappointed. I love you.